Okay, well, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Pete Buchanan and I am with uh, Montana Campus Compact. Uh, unfortunately, Josh Vanek uh, can't be with us today, so I'll be standing in uh, while he's away. So you join us today for the sixth installment of the Centering Indigenous Knowledge uh, webinar series, uh, as we hear from our guest panelists, Emerson Bull Chief and Tim McCleary from Little Bighorn College. Uh, before I hand over to our uh, Master of Ceremonies, Dr. Carla Bird, uh, I'd like to take a moment just to acknowledge our event sponsors for today, uh, without which uh, we wouldn't be able to do the webinar series. So a big thank you to the University of Montana, uh, Montana State University, Reach Higher Montana and RJS Associates. We sincerely appreciate all your support. Uh, so, uh, without further ado, I will hand over to Dr. Carla Bird. Carla. Thank you. Um, I'd just like to welcome everyone to our series, and thank you so much for attending our series each and every week. Um, today, we want to welcome Little Bighorn College, and please keep in mind, next Wednesday, we will have Stonechild College. The following Wednesday, we will have Salish Kootenai College and that'll end our series. So we have three more tribal colleges to hear from. Um, but today it's Little Bighorn College and a little bit about Little Bighorn College is um, part of its mission. Well, it, it was established as a land grant institution. Um, it is the Crow Higher Education and Cultural Center that grants not only Associate of Arts, but also Associate of Science degrees and certificates in areas that reflect the developing economic opportunities and social needs of the Crow Indian Reservation and surrounding communities. Um, the college is dedicated to the professional, vocational, and personal development of individual students for their advancement in higher education or the workplace and inspiring Crow and American Indian scholarship. The college is committed to the preservation, perpetuation, and protection of Crow culture and language and respects the di distinct bilingual and bicultural aspects of the Crow Indian community. Little Bighorn College is committed to the advancement of the Crow Indian family and community building. Uh, if you take a look at their website, um, you'll see that Little Bighorn College has an Associate of Arts in Crow Studies. And some of these classes include uh, Native American Studies, Crow Indian art, music and dance of the Crow Indians, Crow oral literature, Crow history, horse and Crow Indian history and culture, American Indian political science, economics in Indian country, American Indian law, and that's just to name a few of the courses they offer. Um, today, we will have presenters, both Dr. Emerson Bullchief and Tim McCleary. And Tim McCleary is a liberal arts instructor at Little Big Bighorn College and Dr. Emerson Bullchief is the academic officer. So with that being said, I'll hand it over to both Emerson and Tim. Thank you, Carla. <clears throat> um, thank you, Dr. Bird. Uh, we have actually Tim's PhD too in, uh, in archeology span and anthropology. So, uh, well, I don't know exactly, uh, I know we, we've talked about this and we, we have our language program first, so I'll have Tim kind of talk about that and then we'll kind of get into the sciences that we, we have planned and that are, we're teaching now. Okay, so um, the Crow language is, uh, is still very vibrant. We, uh, as a community, you still hear, hear it spoken on a daily basis. Uh, so the, the issue has become generational. So younger people might understand the Crow language. They might say a few words, but they don't really speak it. And so the issue most recently, beginning in the 2000s, was to how to reverse that trend 
And of course, the Crow language instruction here at the college has been going on for some time. Crow language has been offered at the state level since the 70s. So uh, what is now MSU Billings and MSU Bozeman both offered Crow language classes in the past. <clears throat> but as Little Bighorn College developed, um, then the instructors that worked at those institutions actually came here and developed the program here. And uh, that became not only a focus on language, but then also a focus on the distinctness of the Crow culture itself. And so there are, of course, like with any native nation in the world, um, each one has its distinct characteristics. For Crow, I would say that um, that would be kinship, the clan system as it exists and is practiced. So that's a very distinct feature of Crow culture. And it's from that that many aspects of uh, the Crow culture thrive. So that was one aspect that is focused on in the Crow Studies program. Um, so the language, you can do one and two, Crow language one and two here. So one is basically a uh, in beginner's vocabulary with, uh, with writing, how to write it, how, how Crow sounds are written. And then Crow language two becomes more complex, how grammarous, grammar structure, um, even you know, things such as irregular verbs, that kind of thing. And then the third type of class that's offered here is conversational Crow. And that's like conversational language anywhere. So basic phrases are, are practiced and used. Um, so question, common questions and answers readings and um, basic activities. Uh, so eating food, uh, language that might be associated with um, etiquette, those kind of things. So from that, um, if a person does both Crow language one and two here, that actually fulfills the language, state language requirements. And which, of course, do vary uh, depending on the institution. So MSU Bozeman has a specific language uh, credit that, that undergrads have to take, but that's fulfilled with that Crow language one and two. Missoula uh, doesn't have a language specifically. They call it symbolic arts. Uh, but then again, as long as a person has taken Crow language one and two, that fulfills that, that component. So we have that aspect. <clears throat> then we also have uh, we, we also have Crow language now being instructed in uh, K through 12 classrooms, and um, that uh, has been an ongoing project for well over 15 years now. Okay, so in the very recent past, we did have immersion schools. They lasted about three years, but due to uh, funding uh, and the way that funding worked for those, those schools, we weren't able to maintain funding. So at the moment, those are dormant, but the, the uh, structure of them and <coughs> the curriculum is, is developed. So once funding is, is found again, then they can certainly be put back into place. Okay, another thing which the institution is involved in is the Crow Language Consortium. And this has been ongoing for about 10 years. And what that is, is the development of, of uh, materials in the Crow Language. And probably the most important is uh, the Crow Language Dictionary, which is online now. And it's updated almost weekly. And you can see it by going to uh, dictionarycrow.org. And uh, if you go to it, you'll see that you can search it by English or you can search it by Crow, by the Crow language. And then if you go to the, so if you search it by English and you find the word, then you can go to that word. And it, of course, it'll tell you the Crow word 
once you have the crow word, there'll be two speaker symbols there. And um, those speaker symbols are a man and a woman saying that word. So you can touch on it and, and then it'll have a man saying the word and then a woman <laughs> saying the word. And uh, in most cases, of course, men and women say the word in a very similar fashion, if not exactly the same, but there are differences, gender differences in how words are said that do exist. And then just last year, this was put into um, a um, hard copy. Um, but I mean, for my, you know, the hard copy is nice to have, you can hold it in your hand. But for me, the, the um, online dictionary is actually easier to use and search. But either way, um, so that's one thing that's come out of that. Another thing that's come out of that, well, the, the actual development of the dictionary was done through a rapid word collection process. So groups of Crow speakers were gathered together. They were asked certain domains and then they replied to those domains in the Crow language. And then those words were recorded and then eventually um, broken down and then put into the dictionary. And because of that, the Crow language is one of the best recorded Suan languages uh, in the United States. But this gets this brings us to the language itself. Crow is what's called a polymorphemic language. That means that the sounds in the Crow language have meaning. This is opposed to English, which is what's called a monomorphemic language. That is that the sounds themselves don't have meaning, but it's how the sounds are put together that has meaning. So that is an incredible difference between the two languages. And what that means is that the, um, in the Crow language, if a person is proficient in it, they can actually, and understands the mechanics of the language, they can, um, um, <coughs> they can actually manipulate those sounds and create new words. So in fact, they say that like a, the people who are public announcers, people who it's really kind of their profession to be able to speak the Crow language, they say with those individuals, because they're so proficient in the language, they can do that. They, they understand the mechanics of the language and they understand the meanings of the, the morphemes in the language and they're able to manipulate them. So when people hear them, they immediately know what they mean, even though that word has never been said before. Um, then, uh, <clears throat> okay, from the Crow Language Consortium then, then teachers have been trained in how to teach K through 12, teach the Crow Language and Crow Culture, K through 12. And that's probably been, I would say, the most effective aspect of that project because it, that's what we need. We need the youth to be able to speak the language. That's the foundation. And in the, in the human race, our generations move very quickly. So here on the Crow Reservation, we are already clearly into the second generation of people who can't speak the Crow language well. Um, so the only way to stop that is for the youngest children to be able to speak it fluently. And then that will eventually, um, that will eventually reverse that course. And this is possible. This has been done in other communities, other native communities. So such as the uh, Haudenosaunee in, in uh, New York state, the language was basically threatened in the 1980s. And the community itself decided that they didn't want that to keep recurring. The main reason it was happening there is because children were being educated off the nation in New York City. So they weren't being exposed to their language. So older people could speak the language, but younger people couldn't. And then when they had children, then of course their children weren't learning the language. So an immersion school was developed there so that those families that weren't living on the nation could send their children to that school. And within a generation, it was spoken again. So you would go into a store. I, I lived up there for a short time. You'd go into a store, and you hear small children speaking to their grandparents 
in their native language that their parents didn't know what was being said. So it, it's possible. And, and of course, in the world, worldwide, the greatest language revival we've ever seen is in Israel. They took a dead language and they made it a living language, Hebrew. So it's more than possible. It, you know, just because a language is threatened or it's having some difficulties, it's, it doesn't mean that it's the end of that language. Uh, so, I mean, I, I think for, as far as the, how, in, how language is instructed here, I think that's, that's a, a good overview of it. I don't know if anybody has any particular questions. Well, there's a few things too that I'll mention as not only are we generating like the dictionary, but we have other, I think there's a bunch of book books right there that, oh, yeah. that kids books that, that we're using that are being created through the language consortium. And um, <clears throat> yeah, so we have, we have a couple kids books that are, that have been released. I just got a whole shipment of them that are at the house that I'm reading through now. But, um, and then the, with our work with the language consortium, we have, at the college, we applied for an a and grant that, which, that we received. And we're now in the process of doing, um, uh, we're in the process of, of developing a language um, learning application, online learning app. So that way these younger kids are easier, have an easier time connecting to online, online learning uh, platforms. Right now, I think the state already developed the one that that uh, mm -hmm. that's being offered yeah. uh, and we're with with the uh, a a grant we're in we're developing that even further uh, to go to the website. yeah the sticky kid can go to the website to order these books A language web website yeah, pro language the language consortium website um, and then there is a there is a store on there a bookstore on pro language.org yeah, prolanguage.org. You can get those books ordered. So that's that's one one part of it. And then another innovative part that we're trying to do is most of the crow language classes are taught in person, but we're offering a evening session on Mondays, like a three hour evening session. That way, the parents of those kids that are learning in K through twelve can their parents are invited to take that evening course so that they can learn alongside with their with their children and then they can speak it in a home. I mean, I was a, that was my first language. It was spoken in a home and we continue to speak Crow here that way, but they're, my brother who's seven years younger than I am can barely, he understands it, but he cannot speak it. And that's part of that generational gap that we're, we're losing that. That's just seven years between me and my brother. So, those are different parts of the language pro, uh, programs that we're offering here. <clears throat> so I guess we'll go ahead and jump into the other part of this, which is continuing to expand our culture, cultural knowledge. A lot of people are, especially the younger generation, are unaware of it. So we offer a lot of the uh, classes that, that were mentioned earlier to revitalize that cultural knowledge. And, and through this, um, we're still maintaining on that, on that particular path, but we're also expanding where there is environmental knowledge. So right now I have a class that I teach. It's, it's called Apsologue Science, which kind of looks at how Apsologue people look, look at sciences, how they understood the natural environment and how they interact with the natural environment. But then the, we're working on adding a new class that will be based on understanding of the seasons. Right now, you know, there's different times of the season that, that we follow all year. And then there's different times of the day, there's different types of clouds, there's, there's uh, the plant, we have plant names for a lot of, a lot of things a lot of the plants that are out there, animal names, uh, anatomy, knowledge of, of buffalo, deer. 
So we, we have all this knowledge that we're trying to be able to incorporate into our classes here. Eventually, hopefully what we're planning on doing is having a, a four-year <coughs> Apsologate Anthropology degree. That's, that's the goal, that's the plan, that's what we're working towards. And I guess I can open up to uh, questions for now, unless we come up with something that, something that triggers us to talk for a little bit. <laughs> Hi, um, I believe there's one question um, from Suzanne. Where do we order the books? Oh yeah, I think we said it's uh, crowlanguage.org. Crowlanguage.org. There's a store there. Yeah. On that website. Okay, so some of the things, I mean, there are some things that have been going on for uh, you know, quite some time in the Crow Studies program. So one thing about the Crow Studies program is there are actually two degrees. One is specific to the Crow culture. And that one is designed for people who are gonna, um, for people who are gonna uh, uh, go into the classroom here on and near the reservation where they're gonna be working with Crow children. So they're gonna get their Title VII certificate and then, and then be able to go into the classroom with that knowledge. And then the other one is an NAS degree, which is more like what an individual might get in their freshman and sophomore years at a four-year institution here in the state. And the intention there is that a person goes on, a student goes on to a four-year to finish a BA uh, in Native American Studies. So when we speak, when we're speaking about the NAS classes, those are very general. So things like introduction to Native American studies, um, social kinship uh, between Native groups, among different Native groups, those kinds of things, uh, literature of the American Indian. But then when we're speaking about Crow studies specifically, these are classes which offer the knowledge and practices of the Crow language. So things like Crow language, music, and dance. So the student is being exposed to uh, various kinds of songs that exist within the Crow culture. And then they're also being shown various forms of dance that occur in those, um, in, with those particular songs. Another one is Crow oral literature. And in that one, a student is, for the first half of the semester is being um, exposed to what are considered retelling stories. These are ancient stories that have been told so many times uh, throughout the past of the Crow people. And they are foundational to Crow philosophy. So if a person is really going to understand the philosophy of Crow people, they're going to need to know those stories and how they function. Um, then the, uh, the next, part of the semester is spent with what are considered historical stories, which primarily focus on intertribal warfare, since that was such a big part of, um, of Crow life historically. So, and then the horse and Crow culture, that one covers various aspects of the horse, how, it, how Crow people came to gain them, how people, Crow people came to understand the animal, uh, how it fits into the spirituality of Crow people, and then, uh, then how it's used, how it was used historically, how it's used today. So ranching, rodeo, parade, those kind of things. So the, the, what I'm getting at is that the Crow Studies degree itself is very much focused on the, on the Crow culture. So, yeah, so... <clears throat> Yeah, I think the Monday night language class, this is the first semester we actually offered it this way online. It is, it is open to, to the is. public. So that's for Susan. And then, uh, so then for um, Garth, we, 
Uh, yeah, all of our, I think even all the buildings are all, yeah. have, have cruel names on all, and all the rooms, the different offices have different names for, the, well, the classrooms actually, not, not the offices themselves, yeah. but the classrooms have different names. But there's been a push to incorporate crow names around here. So if you see the different towns, the interstate signs, they have crow name, the, the crow name on there. So we're, uh, um, so we're able to, to yeah. read them. I, it's, it's hard to, like me as a long, like I spoke crow my whole life. I don't know how to read and write, you know? <laughs> so I, I, it's hard, but now I'm learning more using all these, these uh, tools that we have, like the, the um, dictionary, the online dictionary that, that Tim talked about, which is amazing. You can just, uh, you're able to hear the word, see how it's spelled and hear the word and you're, you're able to spell it more. What can a student do with a degree in girl studies? Yeah, the most, the most um, common reason that a person gets a degree in crow studies is to be able to go into the classroom and be a Title VII instructor, which is a bicultural, bi bi bilingual instructor. So they're used that that um, that type of teaching is used throughout the schools on and near the reservation. Any any school that has a a, a significant uh, Crow student body will have Title VII teachers in the classroom. In some cases, uh, what that means is that the, the Title VII instructor is a um, is a co-teacher. In other cases, it's been um, the um, it's been used as a, a, a kind of an intermediary between uh, standardized Western instruction and Crow knowledge, so that Crow students aren't alienated from from their own knowledge base. So an example of that would be at the Catholic schools here on the reservation. The Title VII instructors there are in the classroom full time with a state, um, a state certified instructor. Well, Title VII is a state certification too, but, but uh, what might be called a standardized uh, teacher. And uh, so that way, if, if there's Crow students in that classroom and they feel uncomfortable about the way one instructor is instructing, then then they don't have to uh, they don't have to shy away from from that classroom or from that knowledge. It's uh, it's in it, the development of Title VII instruction was actually in large part to try to get away from the continuation of assimilation ideas in education. So the the idea that Children are normalized through education. So um, when you have a large group of people who aren't part of what might be considered the dominant culture, then being forced to learn that history and not their own history. So that was the initial response to that was the development of these Title VII instructors. <clears throat> I think Crow language, so for Miranda, the Crow language, one is a required class for all programs. Yes. And there, most, most of the students we have are Crow and they, they're familiar. And so there really isn't, haven't heard any complaints from any students about having to take Crow language one. And we do actually have um, Cheyenne people come in and learn and then non-native people come in and learn here. So we, none of them have ever really complained I uh, haven't heard any complaints about it. So it's just part of it. And it's yeah. been part of the, all the programs since the inception of the college. Well, the reason for that is because of the, um, because of the mission statement that we are here to protect and promote the Crow language. So one way in which we do that is that each student has to take a piece of Crow language. Yeah, and then for Marilyn, uh, or Mar Marlin Cloud, um, it is uh, so for the Crow language for Crow studies. Once they're done, they have their Title Seven and they can go on into the classrooms. They don't necessarily need a degree in education or teacher licensure, but we do offer that 
four-year degree with um, U of M, U of M Western. And, and so we, we do have four-year programs from that, that or and I don't know how many were graduating this year, but we do have graduates every, every, yeah. every spring on, in that, with that teaching degree. With the, with the Title VII, um, with the, there is actually at the end of the, so uh, a person goes through the, goes through the uh, process of, of gaining the degree, but at the end of that degree, then they do need to take a Title VII test to make sure that they have the knowledge necessary to, to enter into the classroom. And in many respects, that isn't just limited to uh, Crow culture and language that also deals with um, more broad topics uh, like reading and writing, you know, the, the typical broader topics of, that an education person needs to have once they enter the classroom. But like uh, Emerson was saying, most of the people who are trying to do a Title VII degree are also trying to be a teacher. And so they, they go through the education program here at the college simultaneously. And then they, which is a two plus two program with Western. And then they, uh, uh, then they uh, can work together to get their four-year degree in education and get their state certification. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so those I know a lot of science classes are, or the science programs, they're all starting, the majority of them have already started incorporating the oxology science as part of their requirements. So they're all taking this, and it's a different worldview, of course, from Western, Western thought, Western ideology, <clears throat> to think of natives having a view on, on the natural environment. But it's, it's there, you know, we can't deny it, it's there. So so that's why the science programs have started to have that be included into their programs of study in the psychology science. And I'm sure when we eventually have this environmental science or environmental knowledge course that we will be able to have that be a part of the, of the overall program degrees in each of the science fields. Are there any topics that were dealt with uh, by the other institutions that we haven't addressed? Mm -hmm. Well, as part of the core. Yeah, Carl. Carl. Yeah, they are part of the part of the core. Um, so they they do have to take certain classes to be to finish their degrees in the business um, in the business courses. I don't know how many. How many degrees we have in the business? It's like three. just one now. This is just one. Yeah, yeah. the um, all classes, all degrees have to meet the core requirements, just like any institution. So those core requirements are are the core. So um, math and uh, writing, communication arts, uh, social sciences. But then we also do have a specific pro language category and a specific pro culture category, and they have to take at least one course from those uh, in their core. But then in the diversity category and in the humanities category and the, and the social uh, cultural category, there they have to pick two uh, Crow uh, classes out of that. So even though they have options, they have to take at least two, crow, two, two classes in those cores. The other tribal college, yeah, the guards. I, I don't, I don't know. I, I don't know. Uh, well, it varies. It varies by the by the tribe, of course. So, uh, Blackfeet Community College has a, a pretty strong language program, from my understanding. 
And then uh, maybe the one that has been most connected to the community, I would say, uh, I, would, I would even venture to say that it's even stronger than, than Little Bighorn Colleges is uh, an inn in Dakota at, um, at Fort Belknap because there they're even, they're even part of the immersion schools that take place. And, um, but again, the issue there is that an Inan is, is an extremely threatened language. In fact, I think there's only one native speaker that's still alive. Now others have learned it. So, so you know, it is, it's a, it has the potential of being a viable language. And the fact that it is being taught in immersion schools to very young children, that, then that gives it a lot of hope. So in that respect, it's different than Crow because most Crow children have a lot of exposure to the language, even if it's not spoken in their own homes. Uh, so, but that, but certainly what, what they're doing at Fort Meldap, I, I think is, uh, you know, worth, worth uh, applauding. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that'd be nice. Yeah, I mean, to for Suzanne, um, you know, we've we've never really tried a collaborative effort with the other tribes. There, there of course, is connections between all of the community colleges, tribal colleges, well, even the community colleges outside out of reservations. Um, but uh, there have been collaborative efforts that have occurred over time. It's usually just between two institutions, but never has anybody really tried to do, uh, to do you know, something like that, where each week uh, one tribe gets to present. And that, and that would be great. I mean, but given that here at Little Bighorn College, we already do that. In the summer, there's a three week program, uh, which is specifically directed to language. So, and that's free to students. They just have to, they just have to enroll in it, and uh, to be able to get into it. And then once they're in, then they can either take specific classes. Um, you know, if they if if they're a beginner and they don't feel very comfortable, then they would just stay with the beginner classes. But if if they've taken the beginner classes and they're feeling pretty comfortable with the language, then they can move up to the second level. And then there's even a a third and fourth level. And some people do them all simultaneously. And, you know, they, they won't, they, they'll, because those classes go all day long and they're not consecutive. So if you take the beginner classes, those are in the morning, the intermediary are in the early afternoon and then the upper level are in the late afternoon. Hmm. So, yeah, there, there's one class that that we're looking at at uh, revitalizing. It's been taught here before, but I know with with our current language instructor, we, we want to incorporate the Plains la uh, sign language and get that back up and running because it was offered here for I don't know how many years, and then it just yeah. uh, Dr. Rilbert left, and so now we're we want to re revitalize that that particular course. Mm -hmm. Intersectionality. Wow. So diversity, I, I'm, I'm not completely sure what the question is on. Uh, My anonymous attendee. Yeah. Covered in DEI type whole class. So you're asking about right. how intersectionality occurs within the DIA DEI courses? Yeah, if, if, if you're asking, I, I think I think I kind of figured it out in my head, but all of our um 
we incorporate Crow almost into into everything around here. Um, it's just many of us are continue to speak the Crow language. We continue to have that Crow knowledge base, and so we incorporate that into a lot of our classes here. But also the the idea in the diversity core, then uh, and in the humanities and in the social cultural core. What, what's occurring there is that the students are having an opportunity to see um, how to critically think about particular issues and then uh, how to reflect on that. So an example of that would be like we have a, we have a class called uh, the American Indian in Film. And uh, so many people, many students think when they're going to take that, oh, we're just going to sit around and watch movies about Indians. But in actuality, what they're doing, what the instructor does in that class is they introduce particular topics that are of uh, social relevance and social concern that can be seen through the lens of, um, of, of how Native people have been portrayed or how Native people themselves have, uh, have portrayed themselves in film. But there's other classes that I like. Now yeah, for Sam, we... <clears throat> It would be nice if we were able to, to achieve that. Um, but many of the students, they'll end up starting school in public school where they're taught English. English is it's English based. And so that's the part where we're having trouble. The immersion schools were there and they were good, but just we couldn't sustain it financially. So, but being able to have that like in the, if it's spoken in a home, mother and father speak it. That's how I learn, because that's all we spoke. And that's all we continue to speak when I'm at home. But if the way the current family structure is now, most of the times mother and father don't speak pro at all. They don't, they don't know it. And, and so that's trying to change the mindset of young kids to revert to speaking pro. To them, it's hard because there's a lot of there's a lot of rules incorporated into how we speak crow men speak crow differently than women do um, even how we say things um, and so we have that part of it is the difficult part trying to get young kids to revert from where english is kind of uh unisex where in crow it's different and we speak differently so that's the part the, the hump that we need to get over, the, mm. the thing that we need to overcome. How can we get these young kids to be able to continue to just learn it and speak it at home? And that's why we're doing the other thing with having having both the, um, the uh, yeah, the caretakers being able to speak it. And that's why we're offering that evening course. Suzanne, uh, I think you, you can do that. I think it's, I think you can learn, uh, uh, both, you know, you can take Crow Language One here, but then you can also do the Summer yeah. Summer Institute, Crow, Lang Crow Language Summer Institute. The Summer Institute is open to the public. I mean, everything is at the college. There's nothing that's restricted in any way. Um, so, yes, if you want to if you want to take regular college courses during the fall and spring semester, then you're welcome to do that. You just have to enroll like anybody else. Uh, we have open enrollment, so as long as you meet the criteria, high school degree, and so on, then uh, then you can enter into classes. The Summer Institute is offered yearly, and you can just sign up for it at the beginning of the Summer Institute. So, um, okay. That sign up, we. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, so, okay, Suzanne, uh, on this particular question, um, the emergence of the Crow tribe, I, that's part of it. The seven rams are part of it. But the main understanding is that we, we, had, a, we had two people that had a vision, and one had a vision of porn. Those people remained to be the Hidatsa people in North Dakota, and the other group left to find the sacred tobacco plant. And that's where where we became established as, as Crow people is once we found that particular plant. The, the, seven, the seven 
well, the story is called Uwadeze or Big Metal. And that uh, the, the child didn't fall. He actually got pushed off the cliff by his stepfather who uh, wanted to kind of eliminate that person in his life. And, and he got saved by seven rams that came there and rescued him out of, out of the canyon. So that, that's, that story, it is a long story. We can share it, but I don't know if we have time um, currently. So well, we can. Yeah, these, uh, the different stories, in the case of the seven rams, that's a true story. That's a, I mean, that was a historical figure. That boy. Um, some of these stories, well, in most cases, they're all real people and real stories. The, um, to answer your question, Garth, the words should, yes, they look very long, but they actually, the reason for that is because each symbol has a particular sound. So there's double A's, there's double K's, um, there's double T's. So uh, in those cases, the the sound the the sounds are what a linguist would call aspirated. So a double T is a hard T. A single T is a D sound. So an unaspirated sound. Um, so it, it causes the words to be very long and look very long, but in actuality, they're, they're what it's doing is essentially it's showing you how to sound it out, uh, which in the English language, we don't do that, right? I mean, our, the written aspects of English are so old that we have all kinds of weird components in our writing system. Uh, so there's K's where K's shouldn't be and because uh, they don't make any sense. And there's, there's P's where F's should be, uh, those kind of things. So when the Crow language was, as an alpha, was, alphabet was developed in the 1960s, early 70s, an attempt was being made that each written letter or group of letters represents a particular sound. And so then that way, once a person learned the alphabet, then they would be able to uh, sound out the word. So like for myself, I'm not a, I wouldn't consider myself a pro-language speaker, but I can read and write it. And when I hear it spoken, I know how to write it because of the fact that I've learned the alphabet. <laughs> I was like trying to read it. Yeah. So there was a question earlier about the, the names that appear in the Crow language uh, on the campus. And uh, it depends on what building you're in. So the classroom building, it, it, it's Crow, the Crow name for the classroom building is the clans, the, the Crow word for clans. So each classroom is a name of one of the clans, of the Crow clans. Um, the, uh, and the other, in the other uh, buildings, so like if you go into the administration building, the, the names of the rooms in those buildings are, are a reflection of what is occurring in the room. So one says, where you wait, Amaola, where you wait, so it's the waiting room. And uh, then one says the business office, you know, and so on. So in, the, in that building, the names are actually reflective of what occurs in the, in the room that it's labeled. Yeah, see Miranda, I, I cannot tell you off the top of my head from your question, who's all coming, taking the Summer Institute? It's kind of handled through the Pro Language Consortium. Yeah, well, it, it has, the, we, we haven't had, um, I don't think we've ever had someone from a non-tribal college, well, let's see, non-tribal colleges in Montana. No, I don't believe we've ever had anybody from a non-tribal non college in Montana. Um, we have had people come and observe from other tribal colleges. So uh, Sean Chandler from uh, Anunan, Dakota, who's now the president there. He used to be the librarian and he was the language instructor for a while. He actually came and observed for a summer just to see if something similar can be implemented. Um, and they're, and they're, and their projects that they're doing. Uh, but, and we have had three or four grad students who for various reasons are interested in the Crow language. So uh, we had one who's actually been, she's from Montana. She, she was an ag grad student in horse husbandry. 
And she got very interested in the horse breeding program here. So, which was started uh, during the 1930s. And uh, so from a historical standpoint, she became interested in, but once she started doing it, like with anything here at Crow, uh, there's a lot of the Crow language that's involved in, in, in the development of that program and the way that it functions. So once she really got into it, she realized that she had to have some comprehension of Crow or some understanding of the language to actually be understanding how that program operated uh, here on the reservation. So we've had, we've had different grad students over the years. So what this has done, and, and uh, Emerson touched on it a little bit, the, the fact that, that uh, I think all of the tribal colleges are involved in this. I mean, we definitely are not the only one that's interested in, in uh, preserving and protecting the native language that, of the community which it serves, is that it's brought in interests. I mean, that, that last question you know, brought, brought this to mind. It has brought in interest from uh, not only other tribal groups, but also here in Montana, uh, other state groups. So especially OPI and uh, Office of Public Instruction. So with the passage of Indian Ed for All a few years ago, that was the first uh, real attempts to integrate native knowledge into K through 12 classes across the state. But then more recently, this last couple of years, uh, a development of online language classes. So the very first one was in the Cree language. That one's already up and running. And then the, the one that is being developed right now is the one on, on the Crow language. And OPI is, is uh, looking to do that with every native language that exists in Montana, that, you know, that is spoken in Montana. They've, they've already developed the whole program and already Look, using yeah, it right yeah, yeah they've yeah. already they're already starting to use that online language app and uh yeah the Cree one and the, the crow one is still being developed i mean there are parts of it that are online now yeah but it's still being developed digital what is that digital academy yeah so the montana digital academy is where you can find yeah. all that all that information on on those language learning apps mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know. That's <laughs> any other questions? <clears throat> I'm uh, I'm Dr. Emerson Bull, Chief, the Dean of Academics here. And then... Tim McClary, I'm uh, an instructor in the Liberal Arts Department, and I'm the department head for, for the college. Um, and I do teach Native American Studies and uh, Pro Studies and uh, Liberal Arts, the Liberal Arts Program. All right. Well, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to uh, speak to you. I don't think I was going to establish. Um, I think we might have time for maybe one more question here. Um, dates of the Summer Institute, Elizabeth says, thank you for your time. And then I had one last question, which was, um, what type of learning strategies have been the most effective for the for teaching and learning the language? Um, the dates of the Summer Institute haven't been established yet. Usually that's um, that's Crow Language Consortium that kind of handles a lot of that. So they haven't been in, uh, they haven't been presented to us yet, but we'll, but I'm sure they will. Yeah, it's usually the end of. Uh, 
June or the beginning of July when those are offered. But if one, once we find out, oh, we can let you know, Carlo. We can disseminate, <laughs> disseminate to all the information. As far as uh, uh, as far as what you're asking, uh, yeah, the strategies. The, the the ones okay, so it varies um, typically by age, by generation. So um, the uh, what's been shown to be most effective with um, with like grade school children is um, having them having them practice particular phrases or terms and then speaking it to each other, um, which actually is effective no matter what the age, but it's very effective with, with grade school children. Uh, when we get into high school and college age, many people, many students have already been shamed for the fact that they don't speak the Crow language. So it's very difficult for them to break out of that. And they become very ashamed when they're asked to say things um, in the Crow language uh, because of the language shaming that they faced. I mean, that it's kind of a double-edged sword being in a community that has a large number of speakers, because that means if you're not a speaker, then you, you have the potential of being put down because of the fact that you don't speak it while others do. And, uh, and, and it can be very extreme. And of course, it can be very embarrassing since it is part of identity. And um, so with, uh, with the older students, uh, oftentimes it's rehearsed words where they, they, they become familiar with the term and they become comfortable with it. So they're willing to say it. Um, but then we have public shaming by Vance. <laughs> no, a language instructor where he like forces them to get up and say things in the crow language and uh so you know to get, try to get them past that barrier and um and, and realizing it and, and and i mean i've been in vance's classes and so i know that that he coaches them you know to, to instruct them you know don't laugh at each other you know anybody who's trying is has the right to to try to speak the language those kind of things so that's the there's different approaches that can be used depending on, on age. And then you say aho in Crow. Yeah, to say thank you in Crow is yeah. aho. Well, thank you both for taking the time out of your day, um, your busy day. I know your students and community d depend heavily on, on you guys there at the Tribal College. So thank you so much for your time. Um, and thank you so much for sharing with us today. Um, I think Pete has some last ending comments. Yeah. yeah, thanks. Thanks, Carla. Well, thank you to everyone that attended today's uh, Centering Indigenous Knowledge uh, webinar. Uh, and of course, an extra special thank you to our panelists today, uh, Emerson Chief and Tim McCleary from Little Bighorn College. Fascinating uh, topic. And yeah, just please keep doing what you're doing. Just amazing stuff. Um, the webinar recording will be available on the Montana Campus Compact YouTube page, so feel free to share the event with your friends and colleagues. Um, next week, we'll be joined by guest panelist uh, Robert Murray from uh, Stonechild College, so be sure to register online if you haven't done so uh, already. And as a final plug, uh, at the end of today's session, we also encourage you to complete our, our feedback survey which should pop up um, uh, shortly after we're done so that we can, uh, well, so we can continue to enhance and celebrate the work that is being done on our, our campus partners uh, across the state. So uh, that said, have, have a wonderful day uh, and we really look forward to seeing you next week. So have a good one. Thank you.